It's good to be with you this morning. One of the things when, uh, when you come to a, a time of revival meetings, of tent meetings, it's just the window for, for us as the evangelists is just wide open. We're not given a topic. You know, at different times, uh, next Sunday I'm preaching somewhere and they said, we want you to preach on this so you know where you're going or you go somewhere for a weekend uh, conference and, and this is your theme so you know what you're doing. You come to something like this and it's like, you can just preach whatever you want. And then that gets scary, like, wow, well, God, what do they need? Um, I don't know what all I'm going to be preaching uh, the next several evenings here, but I knew right away that this morning I need to preach this message. I believe that we have people here this morning who are hungry for truth. Amen? Amen? I believe we have people here who are attracting, attracted to zeal and passion for God. Amen? I believe we want to see God work in our world today. And if we're not careful, we can be some of the most vulnerable people to deception. So this morning, you could say this isn't really a, a revival message, more of it's a teaching message. For some of you, this message is a message of warning. For some of you, it's going to be a message of rebuke. For some of you, it's going to be a message of clarity. I don't know where you're at. I still remember standing at the back of the tent two years ago, the same crusade. And one, one brother came up to me and says, you know what I think we need in our church today? I said, what? He says, we need more miracles. We need more miracles. Hey, we like miracles. I don't know if, if you remember this, but two years ago at the tent meetings, the one night when I was preaching, my wife was in Ohio and my, uh, her mother was just diagnosed with cancer. And we had a special time of prayer. Five months later, she's declared cancer free. We like that. A few months later, the cancer's back. And as of November, we buried her. We didn't have enough faith. Where's God in this? Sometimes we, we think that uh, God's supposed to give us whatever we want, and cancer isn't of God. We know that. It's a result of sin, going back to the beginning. But, so God should be able to heal her, and he should keep her fine. If we don't understand some things from Scripture, we end up being confused. Let, let, me, just, let, let me just tell you a short story real quickly in, in Acts chapter 12 before we get into the message this morning. Uh, this is a great story where Peter has been preaching. They've cast him into prison, and, and Herod had killed James, and it, he saw that it pleased the Jews, so he said, you know what, We're, let's get rid of P Peter too, and this will really give him popularity with the Jews. So the next day, Peter is going to be put to death. We're in Acts chapter 12, okay? And so what do you think the rest of the disciples are doing that night? They're getting together for a prayer meeting. What's on the agenda? Peter. So it says in Acts chapter 12, they're praying for Peter. That night, God sends an angel who gets everybody sleeping, wakes up Peter, his chains drop off, you know, sends him out of there. And Peter, when he's released, he goes back to the house where the people are praying and he knocks on the door. And Rhoda... A young lady there, I don't know if it's a servant girl or who she was, but she goes to the door, and when she hears it's Peter's voice, she runs back to the disciples. These are the early church leaders. She says, Peter's at the door. And you can imagine how they've been praying that Peter would be released, that they're like, wow, praise God. That's not what they did. This is what they did. Quiet, Rhoda. That's not Peter. He's in prison. They're going to kill him tomorrow. Let's pray. That's what they did. Now get this. When she insisted, no, I know it's Peter. What did they do? Now it must be his angel. Quiet. We're praying now. When they finally, when she finally convinced them, oh, we got to let him in. It really is Peter. Guess what it says about them? 
They were astonished, is the exact words. They were astonished. Unbelievable. God really answers prayer. Amazing. Okay, if we believe that God answers according to our faith, that one kind of blows that out of the water. Right? I don't understand that. Because I don't see them having faith that Peter would come out, and yet God did it. Wow. Sometimes I pray, and I, I know God can do it. But he doesn't. Sometimes I pray, and I'm like, okay, God, I really wish you would. You probably won't, but please, God, you know, do it, and you don't expect it. And then he does it. And today we live in a day where we're seeking. We want miracles. We want signs, and we want wonders. The title of the message this morning is Signs and Wonders. And this comes out of a series, Try the Spirits. The series begins with how do we discern whether it's of God or not. So much today is done in the name of the Spirit that it isn't. And be careful, brothers and sisters, because I see very few who go down that road of chasing after false spirits who aren't the Spirit of God who ever make it back into the church. Signs and wonders. Let me read you a story. This story comes from uh, Asia Harvest, December 2009. I subscribed to this, so I got this delivered to my, to my mailbox in Chiang Mai. We were living there. The title is this, Christian Elephants Attack Persecutors in India. In 2008, a severe persecution of Christians broke out in the Indian state of Orissa. The end result saw more than 500 Christians murdered and thousands of others injured and homeless after their homes were reduced to ashes. As a result, Asia Harvest responded to help the persecuted believers, including building homes for many families. Recently, a strange and dramatic event took place in Orissa, which has many people talking and wondering. So this isn't something from way back, okay? This, it's 11 years ago this happened. This is what happened after 500 Christians were murdered and many were left homeless. In recent months, herds of wild elephants have stormed villages that are home to some of the worst persecutors. In one village where in August a year ago, which was in August of 2008, the Christians had to run for their lives while their homes were being destroyed by rioters, a herd of elephants emerged from the surrounding jungle. The Restoration Indian Mission reported exactly one year later, at the same time of the day, the persecutors had to run from their lives from nothing left. I'm sorry, the persecutors. So a year ago, Christians were fleeing. Exactly a year later, same time of day, those who persecuted them were running for their lives from nothing less than a herd of wild elephants. Now, that's not amazing if elephants come and chase people. I'd run from an elephant too, even if I'm a Christian, right? But listen to this. This is what these elephants did. These elephants first attacked a rock crusher machine owned by a key leader of the persecution movement. Then they went on to destroy his house and farm. Gaining momentum, they rampaged through other non-Christian homes, demolishing gardens and singling out the homes of persecutors, leaving Christian homes untouched. People ran to the police station to report the disastrous news. In one case, a police jeep that attempted to drive away the herd was attacked and the occupants barely escaped. Truly, God is an avenger of the helpless. These strange attacks have spread, and according to a newspaper report, the elephants have already destroyed more than 700 houses in 30 villages and killed five people. Nobody in this area has seen or even imagined the unique appearance of a herd of wild elephants such as this. The elephants are not ordinary elephants. They appear to be on a mission. Excuse me. Typically, smaller elephants enter a village first, appearing to survey the community. Then they rejoin the herd, and large elephants soon follow and get the job done. Just what's their job, you might ask? We think that it might have something to do with avenging the blood of the martyrs. In fact, the fear of God has fallen on the local people who have labeled these elephants Christian elephants. That's amazing. That's signs and wonders. Now, when we talk about miracles, we talk about signs and wonders. So what, what are miracles? What are they supposed to do? You know, we have, we have two ditches of people. We have those Christians today who say, you know what, we are past the days of miracles. We're past the times of signs and wonders. And maybe they believe that because we don't see a lot of signs and wonders today right here where we're at. So 
maybe in defense of God, we just say, well, we're past that time, okay? Has God's power changed? Is God not able to do amazing things? So I think that's a ditch. We're past the times of signs and wonders. Then we have, on the other hand, we have those who say, we've got to have more miracles. God's got to be doing things. And if we're not seeing signs and miracles within our midst on a regular basis, then something's wrong with us. God's not here. And we're out looking for signs and wonders. I think that's another ditch. So we've got to understand what do, what do these signs and wonders do? Where, why are they given? And where do they happen? Three questions on miracles, signs and wonders. What do they do? Why are they given? Where do they happen? That's what I want us to look at. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. And if you don't have it, I have it up here on the screen for you. And I'd like for us to read this. And as, as I talk with Christians those who are on this ditch that we need more miracles, and if we don't have them there, there's something wrong with us, they quote this scripture. Let's look at this scripture. Mark chapter 16, beginning with verse 9. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, talking about Jesus, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, of whom he had cast out seven demons. We're in Mark 16, verse 9. She went and told those who had been with them as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went to the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe either. Later, verse 14, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he'd risen. He said unto them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will be by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. They will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying or following signs. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I ask that your spirit would speak to our hearts today, that we would understand your word, that we would understand the purpose of why you did miracles, why you still do miracles. So just speak to our hearts, Father. Help us to agree with truth for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We look at verse 17, and it says, and these signs are going to follow those who believe. In my name, they're going to cast out demons or speak with new tongues, take up serpents, and all these kind of things. Unfortunately, too often, brothers and sisters, we take verse 17 and we champion that and we forget the context that that Scripture is given. Okay? The context that this is given is Jesus talking to the disciples, again, to the early church leaders. And when Jesus appeared to Mary, she went and told him, he's alive. And guess what they did? Nuh-uh. They wouldn't believe. Then when she told others, and then they came and told them, they still wouldn't believe. So this scripture comes in the context of Jesus. When he appears to, to the disciples there, he first starts out and he rebukes them for their unbelief. Why didn't they believe? Oh, they believe now because he's there. They see him in person. So this comes in the context of being rebuked for unbelief. And then he gives a command. This is before the signs and wonders. And you know what the command is? Go and preach. Go and preach. And I have highlighted here in my Bible the word follow twice. Follow. These signs will follow the preaching to the unsaved. It's no wonder we don't have signs and wonders in our church today. What signs and wonders does the church of Jesus Christ, who knows that he died and rose from the dead, who we have the truth, what signs do we need within our midst? You want to see signs? According to Scripture, go to those who don't know. Go to those who haven't saved. And do the work. 
and then the signs follow. That's what happens here. So what do, what do these signs? These signs are confirming the preaching of the gospel. We note this first, okay? I want you to note, the signs are not the proof that you're a follower of Christ. The going and the preaching is the proof. Ah. That, we would rather just ask God for miracles than have to go out and preach. But if we're not going to go out and preach, you get no miracles, at least as I see this here. The going and preaching of the gospel is the proof. So let's look at this here. Signs and wonders, okay? What do they do? They proclaim God's glory. True miracles, they proclaim God's glory. Amen? God gets glory when something miraculous is done. It proclaims God's glory. Why? It's for belief in Jesus. Did you know that when John comes to the end of his writing, the Gospel of John, he says, there's so much more I could write, but if I wrote down everything that I've observed and everything that Jesus has done, the world couldn't keep the books. So we're just going to leave it with this one. And then he says this, but these signs were done so that you would believe. The word miracle in the Gospel of John is translated signs. And the signs were done to bring people to belief. If Jesus' purpose on this earth in doing signs was that so there were no more sick people, he didn't accomplish his purpose. Amen? The purpose was to bring people to belief, and the signs are for that purpose. Still true today. The purpose is belief in Jesus. Where do they happen? It follows evangelism. It follows the preaching of the gospel. If you say, I wish we had more signs, more miraculous things happen in our midst, well, let's get some unsaved in our midst. We were sitting around a circle in our small group at church one Wednesday night, and each brother was sharing, and then we're going to pray for each other. And there was one man in the group who's not saved. He's had a, just a horrific background, uh, just so much sadness, so much rejection, so much pain in his life. And he started talking and just kind of took over the thing and started talking more. And we started speaking into this, and there's some almost rejection to this. And then he started just spewing out profanity. This is at church. Now, it's in a small group. We're in a, in a small room. And we just gathered around him and just prayed in the name of Jesus. And that demon was cast out. Till the evening was done, I don't know how many demons were cast out of that man. It would be a rising up. And then in the name and the blood of Jesus, we didn't have to yell, we didn't have to do anything fancy. We just prayed. And then another one would go. And some of them he gave name. We said, is there any more? And he would say a name. We'd pray against him. And then it would just, it would just You know, that doesn't happen when I gather with my Christian brothers and sisters and it's just us. But when we start taking the gospel to those who don't know, that's where it happens. It follows evangelism. Now, I want to show you, let's just get some context to where God does great things to get glory, okay? So I'll take you to a, a couple pictures in Scripture. Signs and wonders in Egypt. Signs and wonders in Egypt. We're familiar with this passage of Scripture. This is what, and, and, and again, my point is this. I want you to understand today who are the signs and wonders for, both in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and now today, okay? We want to understand where are the signs and wonders for. This is what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 3. He says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. So the Lord said to Moses, I've made you as a God to Pharaoh. Aaron, your brother, should be a prophet. You're going to speak that I command you. Aaron, your brother, is going to speak to Pharaoh and the children of Israel out of his land. I'm going to harden his heart, verse 3. Then let's go to verse 4 of Exodus chapter 7. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I, might, that I might lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And then here it is, verse 5. And the Egyptians, verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children from among them, the children of Israel from among them. So the, the ten plagues that happened in Egypt, who were they for? Not for Moses, not the children of Israel. They were for Egypt so that when the children of Israel left, Egypt knows that, you know what, there is a God in heaven and earth. And let's, let's just quickly look at these. 
I'm not going to read over all of these, but it wasn't like God was up in heaven saying, you know, how could we make life miserable for the Egyptians? Flies. Yeah, we were eating supper outside last night, and the flies were landing on our pizza. We don't like that, okay? Flies. That would make Egyptian mad. Let's do the flies, you know? Uh, darkness. That'd be kind of cool. Let's just make it, that'd be kind of dark. Let's make it dark, you know? What, you, frogs. You know, the boys will love it, the girls will hate it. We'll pick on the girls this time. No, God wasn't up there by random saying, let's do this. Every one of the ten plagues were a direct hit on the gods of Egypt. There was a reason for every one of them. So that when these things happened, you know, the God of the Nile, oh, he can't do anything against the God of the Hebrews. And on down through the list, the, the, uh, the God of the earth, when they had lice from the dust, they, uh, they had, you know, the sun God, they had all these different gods. And I'm not going to go through them. But then Pharaoh's the ultimate power in Egypt, and he couldn't even protect his own firstborn from the God of the Hebrews. And when this was done, what were these signs done for? So that all Egypt knows there's a God in heaven and earth. Amen? How many of you here tonight, or to this morning, know there's a God in heaven and earth? Amen? What signs do we need so that we know that? We know. There's a lot of people who don't know, and it's our job to proclaim it. But I don't need a sign. I know. I know. God has done many things. Let's, let's, let's get another one in, in Scripture here. Let's go to uh, signs and wonders in Babylon. Again, God is in the habit of making his name known, of shining light where it's dark, where it's very dark. And God tends to send light, which is who? Who's the light of the world? We are. Uh-huh. What do you do with light? You send it to darkness. God is in the habit of sending light to darkness, and when it's very dark, that's where things happen that bring glory to him. Look what happens here in Daniel chapter 4. This is Nebuchadnezzar speaking here. You would think this would be something like the apostle Paul would write. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. I love this. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. Again, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. That sounds like David writing that. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, how great is his kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom. His dominion's from generation to generation. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said about the God of the Hebrews. If you turn a few pages in your Bible to Daniel 6, you hear what Darius wrote. To all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men and women must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Time out, time out. This is the king who went and captured Israelites. And he's saying, that God, his kingdom's never going to be destroyed. This is Darius. He's the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and he rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. The signs that happened for, for Daniel, the signs that happened in, the ba in Babylon, they weren't for Daniel. They weren't for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were for who? They were for Nebuchadnezzar. They were for Darius. They were for the heathens in Babylon so that they would know that there's a God. So what I want to do to you this morning, now that we've established this, signs and wonders, God can do everything today just like he did back then. His power has not changed. His mission has not changed. That all would know. God's character doesn't change. Just like God came to, those, to the 11 there and he rebuked them because they wouldn't believe the testimony. Brothers and sisters, if we don't believe the testimony of Scripture, I think we're going to get the same rebuke from God. If we're sitting back saying, I need a, I need a sign and then I'm going to believe God. Give me a sign, God, before I believe. Or God, I need more faith and then I'll believe. You know, we get that switched around. Faith is a direct result of your belief. You choose to believe. That's where faith comes from. So I want us to make sure we have this established in our minds 
that God still can do miracles, God still does signs and wonders, but they're done for those who don't believe. Oh, I believe that God will do miracles. Let me clarify this. I believe God does miracles for Christians. Make sure you're with me on this, because some of you are like, oh, brother. I don't think it's wrong to ask God to do a miracle. And I believe that God still does miracles for his people. Okay? Make sure I'm on record on saying that. God still will do miracles for his people. But the primary, the primary goal, it's to bring him glory so people come to belief. And brothers and sisters, we live in a fallen world, and every one of us are going to die unless the Lord comes back and we go back to heaven. This body isn't going to last forever, praise God. And there are those out there that will say, if you have enough faith, if you do this, you know, you're never going to get sick and you're never going to die. I'd say they never read their Bible. God may, you know, the the centurion's son that was healed, he died one day. Because that's the world we live in. We're going to, in heaven, we're going to have bodies that won't die. We're going to live forever then. But right now, we, we... live because of the choice of man to sin, and that's why there's sin, that's why there's sickness, that's why there's death. Signs and wonders. It's for God's glory to bring people to belief. They follow evangelism. I want to give you this morning now three warnings, three warnings for you as a church. Three warnings. Number one, first warning is this. When we seek signs and wonders, we make ourselves very vulnerable to deception. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. And I have it on the screen, so you don't need to bother turning to it. Jesus answered and said to him, Take heed that no man deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will what? Deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famines, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Does that sound like the day and age we're living in? Then they're going to deliver you up to be tribulation to kill you, and you're going to be hated by all nations for my name's sake. You know what? It could be that we as Christians in America are moving towards that place where we're going to end up being hated. Because if we teach Scripture that marriage is one man and one woman, you're hated. We can't, if you stand straight up on God's Word and put it out there, we're going to end up being in trouble. It's it's going to get worse for us. But don't be troubled. Jesus said it's going to happen. Many will be offended. They're going to betray one another. They're going to hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. What do you think the false prophets are going to do to deceive many? Miracles. Miracles. Did you know that in Revelation it talks about the end times and it says that many are going to fall away. And you know what the enemy's primarily way of deceiving Christians is? Through miracles. Ooh. So our first warning this morning, well, let's just look at a couple more verses here. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall rise false Christ, false prophets. They're going to show you great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Mark 13, 22. For false Christ, false prophets shall rise, shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Brothers and sisters, if you're here this morning and you're saying, you know what, I need signs. If you're looking for signs and wonders, you are making yourself very vulnerable to deception. Take heed. Take heed. Let's look at the second warning. The second warning is this. When we seek signs and wonders... We're seeking not just something that God can do, but also something that the enemy can produce and does to deceive us. Are you with me? When we are seeking signs and wonders, we're seeking for miracles, we're looking, we're seeking something that not only God can do, but that the enemy can do and does do to deceive. The enemy has power. He has, he's not a match for God's power, but he does have power, and he will use it to counterfeit. Be careful. Let's look at some scriptures here. 
2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Brothers and sisters, we got to love the truth and we got to stay into the truth, the Word of God. And deception is going to come with maybe you could say 90% truth and then a little bit of error, a little bit of false teaching in it. That's where deception comes in. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This shows that the evil one can and will do signs and wonders to deceive. Again, in Revelation, in the end times, the primary way that the enemy is going to work is through miracles, through signs and wonders. So if you're here saying, you know what, in our church we need more miracles, you're opening yourself up to signs, to things that the enemy can do. And by the way, why don't you believe what Scripture has to say about the finished work of Jesus Christ? Why do you need a sign to prove that God is who He is? I think that if God would come to your church or your home, if you're saying today, God, I just want to mir- do a sign for me, God, so that I know. I think the fact that you're here shows that you do know something of Scripture. And if God would show up, I don't think he would do a sign and a wonder, a miracle. I think he would rebuke you. That's what he did the other disciples. He showed up and he rebuked them. Why wouldn't you believe? He rebuked them for their hardness of heart. Let's look at the last warning. Number three, when we seek signs and wonders, we show strong evidence of unbelief. Maybe this morning, maybe you're the one that needs this message. I don't know. Ask yourself, if if this is you saying, God, just show me a miracle, just show me. Okay, why, why? Why are you waiting to be all out for God till he shows up and does a miracle for you? Are you not believing his word? When we seek signs and wonders, we show strong evidence of unbelief. And I mentioned this scripture earlier. Many other signs, John chapter 20, verse 30. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The signs were done so that you'd have life. And when, people, when, when Jesus did these signs, the people came to belief in him. God got glory. I, I want you to turn to John chapter 4. Let me, I think we got it up here for you. Listen to this story here. I find this encouraging, very interesting. In John chapter 4, this is where this official son is healed. And, okay, look what happens. Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, you can read it up on the screen, where he had made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him, implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, let me tell you something. I am in no means saying don't pray that God heals your son or your daughter, your wife, or yourself. I'm by no means saying that we don't pray for a miracle. What I am saying is if we say, God, I'll believe you if you do it, that's wrong. You with me? To say, God, you can do this. My son's at the point of death. God, you can do it. There's nothing wrong with that. But to say an if clause, if you don't, God, I'm not going to believe, that shows unbelief. You know, I believe our job is to say, God, you can do it, and I trust you. You can do it. But if you don't, I'm going to praise you anyways because you know best and I don't. That's faith, saying God knows best. God knows if his time is done, if it's not. That's where this man comes. He comes to Jesus. Jesus, heal my son. He's at the point of death. Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you'll by no means believe. So Jesus kind of rebukes this man, and maybe the crowd there, unless you see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. Listen to this man's response. Sir, come down before my child dies. It's like, this isn't about belief. God, I just want you to heal my son. And I love the heart of Jesus in this. And he said, go your way, your son lives. Jesus didn't rebuke him for asking. 
And brothers and sisters, if you come believing and asking because of your belief, I believe that God's not going to rebuke you. It's when we ask in our unbelief where the rebuke comes. Jesus, when, when the old man said, come, heal my son, he's at the point of death. He says, unless you see signs, you won't believe. He says, no, come or he's going to die. It's because of his belief he asked. He said, go your way, he's healed. And the rest of the story, he goes back. Okay, let's read it. As he was now going, his servants met him saying, your son lives. Then they inquired of them the hour when he got better. They said, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was the same hour which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. What happens? A whole household comes to belief in Jesus Christ. This is the second sign Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Again, I believe Jesus heals that nobleman's son for the ultimate purpose of bringing that whole household to belief in, in him. I believe God is delighted for that father to have his son raised, healed, and could enjoy a longer life. It's not recorded, but somewhere that son died. That's what happens. God delights to answer the prayers of his people. But the ultimate purpose in the miracles is to bring belief. When we're seeking signs and wonders, we show strong evidence of unbelief. So when is it right? When is it right for us to expect signs and wonders? When is it right for us to expect God to do signs and wonders. Now, again, this is the exception of saying, God, my child's sick. Could you heal him? Anytime your child's sick, pray. Okay, you with me? Again, I'm going to make sure this is straight because some people lock in on these warnings and then, they're, not, and then they, they're mad at me, so they tune me out, okay? It's always right to bring all a request to God. Remember, God's in charge. God knows best. I don't, so I'm not going to command him, but I'm going to plead. God, would you do this for me? Would you do this? Would you protect my boys as they're driving back to college? God, would you heal my mother-in-law? God, I'm going to ask God for all these needs. I'm going to bring it to the, him, and I'm going to bring him in faith that he can do it, but not a faith that he's got to do it or I won't believe. You see the difference? Now, let's come back to here. So, when's it a right place to expect signs and wonders? a place where God's not getting glory, okay? In Egypt, how much glory is the God of the Hebrews, the God of heaven and earth getting? Not really any. So God gets a lot of glory that when the Egyptians let the Israelites go, they actually say, okay, and bless us. They want to be blessed. Where's a place where God's not getting glory? In Babylon. So now the king stands up and he makes a decree that everybody stands in awe and worships the God of the Hebrews. How about the, it, what happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in D Daniel chapter 3. That whole ceremony was for the glory of King Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know how he dismissed those people that day? He says, you go home and make sure none of you say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to cut you up in pieces, make your house into a trash heap. You're dismissed. That's how he ended Daniel chapter 3. They were brought for his glory. They were left saying, don't you say anything against the God of the Hebrews or I'm going to cut you up in pieces. Guess what all those people went home and talked about with their family that night? Uh-huh, the God of the Hebrews. Guess what happened the next morning in Daniel chapter 3 when the families got up and the, and the men went off to work and the ladies were up and they were washing their clothes and they looked up and they see this 90-foot image there. Guess who they thought of? How great King Nebuchadnezzar was? Not a chance. They thought of the God of the Hebrews. Wow, God knows how to get glory. And guess where God's in the habit of making, of getting glory and doing signs and wonders? In places where it's dark. So a place where God's not getting glory. A place where people have not heard the gospel. A place where we're evangelizing. These are common places as I study Scripture where God does signs and wonders. A place where God's not getting glory, a place where people have not heard the gospel, a place where we're evangelizing. We need to understand this, okay? For us as believers, the goal is not miracles. That's not our goal, brothers and sisters. Our goal is for God to get glory, amen? 
We want God's name to be lifted up. And sometimes the, the way that his name needs to be lifted up is when we repent and confess our sins. Sometimes the way his name needs to be lifted up is when he does a miracle. But our goal is that God gets glory. If the goal is for miracles, the enemy's going to come in and is going to sweep us off our feet because he can do that exact same thing. Now, really quick on this, and this is just coming to me. It's not, it's not in our notes. But a key difference between signs and wonders that are really of God and signs and wonders that are of the enemy is the one that is used to bring about those miracles or signs and wonders. If it's truly of God, man doesn't get glory. God's name gets glory. If it's deception, if it's of the enemy, some person, some ministry is going to get glory. Okay? There's going to be pride in that when it's of the enemy, not when it's of God. The goal is not signs and wonders. The goal is God getting glory. And the means, and the means to God getting glory is believers making his name known to the unreached. So if the, the goal for us as believers to make God's name known, you know how you can do it the best? You go out and preach to the lost. We need to evangelize. That's our job. So in bringing this message to a conclusion. Therefore, our response to this message must be, here it is, go and preach the gospel. Go and preach the gospel. You know where we started with this? In Mark 17, where oh, these signs are going to follow. Follow what? The preaching of the word to the lost. Let's not champion where Verse 17, where signs and wonders, I'm sorry, we're in Mark 16. Let's not champion verse 17 where it talks about signs and wonders. Let's champion Jesus' command to go and preach. And when we go and preach, then the signs are follow. It's kind of like going to the coffee maker. I enjoyed coffee this morning before uh, I came. When, we, uh, when I went to my coffee maker, I, I didn't look at that thing and say, you know what, I want coffee. I, I thought that but I knew what to do. I opened the cupboard, I got out the filter, I got out the coffee, and I, uh, I put in the coffee. And I put in my favorite coffee. I get it from um, uh, my friend Stephen Burkholder. It's N the Nepalese coffee, Kathmandu coffee. It's good stuff and supports missionaries over there. And so I had Kathmandu coffee this morning. Some brothers there have had this stuff too. So I'm, dr I'm drinking, that's a free advertisement for them. Uh, I'm drinking uh, or making this Kathmandu coffee there. And so wh while that's brewing, I know in a few moments I'm going to eat my coffee. You know how ridiculous it would be if my sons come down, who a couple of them also want some coffee, and they see their dad standing at the coffee maker saying, I want coffee. I want coffee. Give me coffee. They'd be like, Dad, turn it on. Put in the filter. Put the coffee in. No, no, I don't need to do anything. I'm just going to say, I want coffee. Wait, okay, that's really, okay, pardon me, that's stupid. But isn't that like Christians saying, I want signs, I want wonders, I want miracles. God, give me miracles. Give me miracles. And God's saying, okay, go, go. No, I don't want to go. I want to stay at home. I want to stay with Christians. I want to work with Christians. I want to fellowship with Christians. I don't want to go out into the world. They make fun of me. It gets messy out there and deal with them. I want to stay in my comfort zone. Give me signs and wonders. And God's saying, go. The signs follow. No, I don't want to go. Maybe that coffee illustration isn't so far off. Our job is to go and preach the gospel. Our job is to make Jesus' name known to the unsaved. That's our job. And brothers and sisters, when God wants to show up and do a sign and a wonder, let him do it. Praise God and make sure he's getting the glory. He can do it. But that's not why we're out there. We're out there for his name to get glory, to proclaim the law. Let me just, just quickly tell you this story. I, our family spent four years in the island of Grenada as a uh, missionary pastor there. And we had, when we moved there, I remember in the first three weeks as I was overlapping time with the uh, current missionary pastor who was going to head out there, we trekked all over the hills, and he'd introduced me to these people, and, and that's why I learned how to remember names of people. I, I was desperate. I knew I had to, so I kept three by five cards in my pocket and write down a name and try to describe them a little bit. You know, this guy, you know, carried a walking stick. You know, this guy had this. This guy, you know, you know he lived up, whatever. And so I'm trying to remember names, and I still remember he said, uh, those guys there, they're the neighborhood thieves. That's kind of a nice way of, you know, he didn't introduce me to them like that. Uh, those guys are thieves. Okay, be careful of them. Okay, we'll be careful of them. So I knew them as neighborhood thieves. Uh, the one son in particular, there was four boys there in that household. 
the uh, one man, young man, probably about 15, 16, he would come to our youth nights uh, because it was games and food, right? Uh, so he would come to our youth nights. And one day I came home. Our family had been out, and, and I came home. And our neighbor lady was standing up there, Miss Jenny, and she had her arms crossed. She said, Pastor Rick, I see the neighbor boy. And she said his name. He there teething your things. I said, what? Yeah, he's teething your things. He's stealing your things there. This is what he do. He'd take a barrel, and he'd stand it up there, and he'd stand on the barrel, and then we, you have bars on your windows so that you know, people don't break in, but it's always hot. We don't have air conditioning, so you have louvered windows so they open up, but the bars keep people out. Well, he took a stick and would reach in the window, and he hooked it on to one of the school teacher's digital camera and then can pull it over to the, you know, to the window, and then he can get it. She said, I see him. He's doing that. Ah. Well, this young man comes by, and I say, hey, Come here. Miss Jenny say, you're teething the things. You do that? No, not me who do that. You know, that's the, the tip. What did I expect from a thief, right? Yeah, that's me. I'm back for seconds. No. No, I not do that. I looked over at Jenny next door. She's like, yeah, he do that. No, I don't do that. And I've got a school teacher who lives in the basement below us, and she's, you know, losing her things from this guy. Yeah, she said, yeah, see over, look over the hill. Right over there is the barrel and the rod. I went over there and I looked over the edge because we're on the side of a mountain, right? I looked over the edge and there it is. There's the rod. It's like everything my neighbor's saying to me is true. There's the rod and there was the barrel that he, you know, set up so he could stand on this 50-gallon barrel and, and get the things out of there. So I looked at this young man. You do that? No, not me who do that. <laughs> I look at Miss Jenny. And then something I never thought of doing before. I said, listen, you say you're not the one who do this. The neighbor lady say, she see you do it. I see you with my own eyes. I said, is it okay if I just pray that if you're innocent, because I don't know. I thought I knew, but I didn't. I didn't know for sure. Is it okay, and I just put my arm around this young man. Is it okay if I pray that if you're innocent and if she's lying about you, that everything's just going to be fine for you, Right? But if she's wrong, if you're lying, I'm just going to pray you just get sick until you confess. Are you okay with that? You know, what's he going to say? Of course. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. All right. So I just prayed. I just put my arm around him. I didn't yell. I didn't do anything fancy. I just prayed. I said, God, you, you know what the neighbor lady's saying? You know what my friend here's saying? God, if he's innocent, if he's being falsely accused, I pray you just give him peace and that things would go well for him. But God, if he is the one that's teething the things, you just make him sick, God. Make him sick till he confesses it. Amen. And he went home, and the neighbor lady went, you know, she went back inside to her house, and I went back to mine. Went off the day, didn't really think much more about it. The next morning, we were there in our house, and all of a sudden, this young man who was there that I prayed over, his little brother came by. Pastor Rick, Pastor Rick. I said, yeah. He said, tablets. I need tablets. So why do you need tablets? My brother, he in the mango tree. He's sick. I was like, oh, Wow. So I gave him tablets. He came by four times that day for tablets. I said, he's still sick? Yeah, you know, he's sick, you know, he's going off. That means he's he got diarrhea, he's vomiting, he's everything. Yeah, he's he real sick. I didn't see that young man for three days. I would see him every day when he would go out the road to work. He'd holler in the house, Pastor Rick, and I'd holler back at him, you know. I didn't see him for three days. <laughs> but on the fourth day, sounds like scripture, <laughs> on the fourth day, when he walked by, in kind of a sheepish voice, he said, Pastor Rick. And I called out to him. And he said, yes, I know, I know. It's not amazing that within a year he gets saved. You see, God did something. He answered a prayer for that man because he didn't know the power of God. He didn't know Jesus. Will God not do a miracle for you and me? Oh, he can. But brothers and sisters, the point of the miracles, the point through Scripture for miracles is to bring God glory, is to make His name known to the unsaved. And if we're here, the church, we're, we're saved today. Why do we sit back and say, God, do a sign for me? He's already done it. Let's go preach it and the signs will follow. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I pray for the church today. Father, I pray for brothers and sisters here today. Father, I pray that our faith would be grounded in who you are. We would read your word, and we would believe it. Father, I pray we would not be of those 
who seek signs and wonders. You've done so many miracles already. We don't need more. But God, there are people in this world today who don't believe. God, I pray today that what is impressed upon our hearts is the command to go and teach, to go and preach, to go and make disciples, to make your name known to those who don't know you. And God, like you've said and like you've always done, you'll be faithful to the preaching of the word. And if signs need to happen in that place, they're going to follow just like it says. But God, help us to get the order straight. We go and preach, the signs follow. Not we stay at home and the signs come for us. Father, if there's somebody here this morning with a heart of unbelief, they've grown up in church and it seems really dead. They haven't seen miracles. And they're saying, okay, God, I need to see miracles. God, I pray that you would speak to their hearts. I pray, God. Uh, God, I know, I know. You're, you're the same God who when that, that nobleman came and said, heal my son or he dies, God, you answer prayers just because you love us. God, you do what you need to do to show them love. But I pray that the struggling person here today would say, okay, I'm going to be faithful to your word. I'm going to obey your word, God. And I'm going to go and I'm going to be a testimony to my unsaved neighbor. Or I'm going to be a testimony in the workplace. I'm going to be a testimony to those that don't know you. And then, God, you just take care of doing the signs and the wonders like you can do. Father, for the zealous and the hungry here today, give them a passion to know you and to make your name known. Help them not to be passionate to see miracles. Help them be passionate to make your name known, God. And the signs follow. God, help us to be passionate for your glory. Father, help us not to be like Jehu, who was passionate about doing great things for you. And in the end, he took not heed to follow you with all his heart. Help us to be passionate, God, to make your name known. And God, you do all the wonders, all the miracles that are necessary in bringing the lost to you. Oh, God, I thank you that we're going we're gonna to come to a day when there's a new heaven and a new earth where we're going to have a new body and there's not going to be cancer and there's not going to be death. There's not going to be separation. But God, while we still live in this sin-cursed world, we still live because of the effects of sin. Help us to trust you, to believe in you, to follow you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, we need your Spirit to guide us in truth. We need your Spirit to help us discern. Father, in our own country, a country where on our money it says, in God we trust, our world's turned against you. Father, I pray that when the world turns against biblical truth, I pray that we as Christians, we as the church, would be humbly bold and courageous for your honor and for your glory. Speak to us, God, for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.